Well, there was a historic papal meeting between Pope Francis and Patriarch Karel, who's the um, patriarch of the uh, Moscow uh, Russian Orthodox wing, you might say. There's, com- there's competitors, by the way, for Russian Orthodoxy. So I, it, that's why this gets messy. But the meeting between Pope Francis and Patriarch Karel was long awaited. It was an important step in mending um, conflicts between East and West. There are lots of lingering questions. They did sign a joint declaration. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church has close ties to Vladimir Putin, and this has been, of course, a big topic on this program, especially as it relates to Ukraine and Ukrainian Catholics. Joining me right now is Father Andrew Sharovsky. We talked last week uh, before the meeting. He is on the faculty of theology, uh, faculty of theology at St. Paul University in Ottawa, and the founding director of the Sheptitsky Institute. He's the editor-in-chief of Logos, a journal of Eastern Christian Studies. And, Father, it's good to have you back. Thanks. Thank you, Al. I'm glad to be here. Now, you are a Ukrainian Greek Catholic, is that right? Exactly, yes. Yes. Now that you've read the Joint Declaration, what do you think? Are you you a happy man? Well, um, there are parts that make me very happy. You know, the parts that stand up for persecuted Christians in the Middle East and North Africa. The parts that stand up on life issues that uh, call for cooperation uh, in life issues in the uh, fight for religious liberty in the face of uh, radical secularism. Uh, It's called for young people to get active uh, in the faith and in mission. All those things are great. Mm-hmm. I love that. Okay. But there are three paragraphs w- in which I believe the uh, Russian Orthodox Church, with the help of uh, the Putin government, simply outmaneuvered the Pontifical Council for Christian Unity so that some uh, three very unfortunate paragraphs make up one, so that's three out of 30. One-tenth of the document is severely flawed. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, let people know some of the history here. Okay, so paragraph because, 25. Yeah, I mean, yeah, first of all, I mean, who is, is before, 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 Father, before we go there, who, who in the world is um, um, Patriarch Kirill? He's Patriarch of Moscow. What kind of jurisdiction is that? Well, uh, that's the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, the Patriarchate of Moscow goes back only to 1589. It was created on the basis of the Metropolia of Moscow, which goes back to 1448. Before that, you had the Metropolia of Kiev, you know, Kiev, the capital mm-hmm. of Ukraine. Um, but when the head of the Metropolia of Kiev, Metropolitan Isidore, at the Council of Florence in the 1430s, established full communion with the Church of Rome and the whole Catholic Church, uh, Moscow broke away and created a Metropolia of Moscow, 1448. Uh, And since then, the uh, Russians have been uh, separate from the Kievan Church. However, in the 17th century, when the Russians started conquering parts of Ukraine and Belarus, they also finally got their hands on the Metropolia of Kiev and made it a part of the Russian Orthodox Church. It is actually the mother church for both the Ukrainian Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox, and also for the Ukrainian Greco-Catholics, like <laughs> myself. Wow. The Church of Kiev, founded in 988, uh had intermittent relationships with uh, with Rome, even after the Orthodox East and the Catholic West went their separate ways. So that okay. in the uh, in the middle of the 13th century, the Metropolitan of Kiev was at the Second Council of Lyon. At, in the middle of the 15th century, the Metropolitan of Kiev was at the Council of Florence. And then in 1596, the bishops of the Metropolitan of Kiev signed the Union of Brest coming into full and visible communion with uh, with Rome and the Catholic Church, and 
since then, we've had an uninterrupted life in communion. That's the Ukrainian Greco-Catholics. Okay. We have our brothers and sisters, Ukrainian Orthodox, mm-hmm. and, and some of them are under the jurisdiction of this patriarch of Moscow. Uh, the majority of them actually are not. Uh, they, they want to be independent uh, under the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Kievan Patriarchate, but um, that is not recognized by the rest of the Orthodox world because Moscow says, don't you dare. Yes, and, okay. Uh, okay, so it's a complicated picture. And it I, is. I wouldn't be surprised if, if listeners are saying, whoa, whoa, my head's spinning. <laughs> yeah, it is complicated. But that's important to understand paragraph 25. Right. Because paragraph 25 it says something very good. Uh, it says that even though the method of uniatism is not, is, is not going to be used anymore, in other words, nobody's going to go in and try to get a piece of the Orthodox Church to go Catholic. Uh, but it says, nevertheless, the Eastern Catholic churches that already exist have a right to exist and they have a right to take care of all the needs of their faithful. Well, this is something that that the Orthodox and Catholic churches agreed on back in 1993. So 23 years later, finally Moscow is agreeing with the rest of the Orthodox world on this, that we Eastern Catholics actually have a right to exist. Well, but thank but you are very the much. Eastern but are the Eastern Catholic churches regarded as churches? Or are they just ecclesial ah. communities? Right. Well, there's some very... Of course they should be regarded as churches, and, and Rome certainly regards them as churches. The Catholic Church is a communion of 23 churches. Uh, and uh, these churches govern themselves. They're churches sui iuris, which means they govern themselves. Um, so in the eyes of the Catholic Church, they are certainly, ca- they are certainly churches. But in this document... For some unknown reason, they're called ecclesial communities, which is a term that the Catholic Church uses usually for Protestants. Right, right. Uh, Because ecclesial communities are generally thought not to have all the marks of the Church. Exactly. So now, here's the mystery. If if Cardinal Kurt Koch, the uh, prefect of the Pontifical, Pontifical Council for Christian Unity was involved in the drafting of this? How could he? He, of all people, knows the, what those terms mean. Yep. That's his bread and butter. Right. How could he have allowed that to happen? Well, because he was outmaneuvered or, pro, or maybe just gave up and said, okay, whatever you guys want, let's just make this meeting happen. Yeah. Because... Uh, Pope Francis wants to embrace Patriarch Kirill because he's a, and he wants to talk to him face to face. And you guys have been for three decades putting off this meeting. Why? It was always because of these Ukrainian Catholics. We couldn't possibly have a meeting because the Ukrainian Catholics exist. And it's like, now they said, okay, yeah, okay, let them exist. But we'll see how that translates into action. Because uh, Moscow has been reviling the Ukrainian Catholics for the last three decades, and it's, it's been bad. The other thing is, Moscow has not ever uh, agreed to uh, hold a, a meeting in which they would discuss uh, what happened 70 years ago. All, in a couple of weeks, it's going to be the 70th anniversary of the destruction of the Ukrainian Greco yeah. Catholic uh, Church. Father. And, because we're out of time on this, I'm going to ask you to join me again when we can give more time to this 70-year uh, recognition. But uh, great, great job. Thank-